I want you to stand. I want you to stand. I'm beginning a new series of messages called Family First. Family First. And I'm so excited about preaching and talking to you about, from the Word of God, about how uh, your family can be helped. Our scripture today is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Now look, keep in mind, Peter wrote this, and Peter was married. You said, preacher, you don't know that. Yes, I do, because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. That's why he denied the Lord. <laughs> First Peter 3 and 7 says this. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let's read it again. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And Lord, I'm certainly no authority on the family. I'm certainly no authority on marriage. But God, you are. <laughs> and your word is. So I pray today that you would just uh, speak to us and through us. And I pray today, God, that you would give your word a free course to travel. And it would find a lodging place in the hearts of people. And God, for all you do, we're going to praise you. For I pray this prayer with a grateful heart, for I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Till you come, we pray, amen. You may be seated. I wanna to talk to you today about what every wife needs. What every wife needs. Now, here's the most important thing I'll say. Most important thing I'll say, I'm saying right now. There is a 100% success rate in marriage. There is a 100% success rate in marriage if it's done God's way. A 100% success rate. And God meant for marriage to be good. Think about this, when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the Garden of Eden. What, what's the word Eden, this garden? What does Eden actually mean? It means, it means paradise. God never meant for marriage to be bad. God meant for marriage to be good. Now, we gotta understand something. You say, Pastor Benny, uh, our churches are out of order. Well, folks, if we think we can have strong churches and not have strong marriages, we're delusional. Uh, 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 churches won't be strong if marriages are not strong. Literally, you say, well, well, well what about our government? Well, we're, we're not going to have a strong government if we don't have strong marriages and strong family. Everything boils down to the, to the family. It boils down to the marriage because God created family before he created anything else. Now, I'm going to make a statement that's very important. I've got some friends that are coming to help me at this time. And the reason why they're coming to help me at this time is because 89% of everything that you learn, 89% of everything that I learn is visual. So what I mean by that, what you see is so important. Now understand this. God created marriage to replicate his image on earth. God created marriage, that may be the most important thing I say, but God created marriage to replicate his image on earth. Let me explain. In Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. Marriage is to replicate God's image on earth. Let us make man in our image. Now here's the one, why, why didn't God say this folks? Why didn't God say, let me make man in my image? 
But he didn't say that, you can read it. He said, and God said, let us make man in our image. And then if you jump to the next verse, it says, male and female, he created them. Let us make man in our image. Now wait, if, it, if it's us, there's more than just him. Well, the Bible says we gotta figure out who, who, who the others were. Well, in John 1, verse one, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, you say, well, now the Word was there from, from the beginning, Pastor. Who, who's the Word? Well, it tells us in John 1 and 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We know the one who came in the manger. So in the very beginning, not only, not only was, was God there, but, but Jesus was there too. Not only was God there, but, but, but Jesus was there. But who else was there? Well, let's go to the Bible. Genesis 1 and 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. People said, no, wait, Pastor Benny. I need to go, I need to know where God came from. I'm gonna help you. In the beginning, God. He didn't begin when the beginning began. He began the beginning, amen? He didn't start with start, he started start. And before there was a was, he was, amen? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, look what he says. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But who else was there? The Spirit of God. Let us make man in our image. So we've got God, God the Father. We've got God the Son. We've got God the Holy Spirit. Now wait, what's the purpose of marriage? It's to replicate God's image on earth. God created man. Now I wanna ask you something. Does that look like that? No, no, that doesn't look like that. And I said God created marriage to replicate his image on earth. So God created man and he said, it's not good that man should be alone. And he provided a helpmate for him, a kingdom connection. It's not good that man should be alone. But here's the question, does that look like that? And the answer's still no. But if you take a Jesus following man and you take a spirit filled woman and you put God between them, then it does look like that. Now, let me say some things to you. Let me say something so you can understand. Understand, when the man was alone, the devil didn't bother him. But there's devil in those angel eyes. The devil didn't bother him till this came along. <laughs> devil in those angel eyes. Amen. Amen. So, so wait, wait, wait. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to understand, why does the enemy hate marriage? Because your marriage replicates the image of God. And the only way that the enemy can get back at God is to bombard his forces on you and on me. And that's why the enemy so greatly hates marriage. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to have a godly man. You've got to have a spirit-filled woman, but you've got to have God right in the middle because a threefold cord is not easily broken. Amen? Would you let my friends know how much we appreciate them helping me? Now look here. 
As I get into this message, I want you to understand something. I greatly understand that men and women are different. You say, Pastor, is a, is a, is a, is a, is, is a man better than a woman? Uh-huh. Uh, wait. He's better at a wo- than a woman at being a man. Is a woman better than a man? Uh-huh. She's better than a man at being a woman. Amen? But see, see, God made us different. Physically, God made us different. Do you realize that a man has 50% more blood in his body than a woman has? But wait, a woman has a stronger immune system. That's why the national average, they outlive us by seven years. Did you know this? Now, when I say this, it's medical, but every woman will say the preacher's right. This is medical. Do you realize that men have thicker skulls than women? I, I mean, folks, we're, 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 we're different physically, but you know, I've learned we're different relationally. I observe things, and a man can be reading a magazine, or a woman can be reading a magazine, and if a woman's reading a magazine, here's the article that she's reading. Five keys to deeper romance. A man's reading an article, here's the article. How to get better gas mileage in your truck. I observed it. Barbara and I would go out and eat with couples, and we still do from time to time, but we'd go out and eat with couples, and Barbara would say to that lady, or that lady would say to Barbara, would you like to go to the restroom? <laughs> and they go. Seemed like they stay a while, but anyway, they go, and I don't know what they do, but they go, and da-da-da, and they stay a while. It's fine, da-da-da. I can't imagine... A guy looking at me and saying, would you like to go to the restroom? <laughs> I'll tell you, if he does, I'm not going. Hey, Amen. I'm just not going. No, 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 no. I'm just not going. Not going. By the way, that's probably going to be the last time we go out to dinner, too, by the way, you know. <laughs> Listen, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about physically. I'm talking about relationally. I'm talking about emotionally. Do you realize, folks, even the brain, the brain developing for a man between the 16th and 26th week of his mother's pregnancy, the right side literally slows down. The right side of the brain, and all women knew men were brain damaged. (laughs) But it's medical fact, the the right side slows down. Because see, that's where men get their emotion. But it slowed down. That's why they'll lean more to logic. But it didn't slow down in a little girl. That's why she will lean more emotionally. Now, I'm going to preach in just a minute, but I'm going to make a statement. There's two ways to handle women. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. (laughs) But here's what I want to say with you. The four primary needs of a woman... The four primary needs, and folks, we do have an obligation because the Bible says in Ephesians 5 and 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. The Bible, get this folks, it says to men, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Do you realize it never says for the wife to love the husband? Now it does say for older women to teach the younger women how to love their husband. But it's never a direct command for the wives to love their husbands. But it is over and over. So what husbands to love their wives as their own body. So there is a responsibility from the Bible to, to meet the needs of a woman, your wife. What are, the, what are the four primary needs of a woman? Need number one is security. Need number one is security. It's it's the greatest need, ladies and gentlemen, it's the greatest need that any woman has. You say, Pastor, you don't don't know my wife. That's okay. It's okay. But it's still the greatest need that your wife has is the need for security. And a, a husband has to communicate security to his wife. Pastor, how do you do that? Well, let me give you four things you can do. Number one, He cares for her 
above everything but God. He's got to communicate that he cares for her above everything but God. When a husband is preoccupied with other things, when he's preoccupied with other things more than his wife, it will create insecurity in his wife. When, he's, when other things seem to matter more than her, it will create insecurity in his wife. It was a great day in my life, church. It was a great day in my life when I realized that Barbara's my bride and the church is Jesus' bride. For a while, I had it crossed up. And I had to realize that Barbara's my bride and the church is Jesus' bride. And if we're going to build security into our wives, we got to let them know that we care more about them than anything else but God. The second thing he's got to communicate is he loves and admires her. He loves and admires her. See, Proverbs 18 and 21 is a powerful verse. It says, death and life's in the power of the tongue. You say, well, words don't matter. Well, that's ridiculous, sir, to make a statement like that. God spoke this world into existence. You tell me words don't matter? This world was created because of a, a God who spoke it into existence. Words created this world, and words can create your wife's world. Words can create your wife's world. Now, wait. Death and life's in the power of the tongue. Nothing's in the Bible just to be in the Bible. That's in Proverbs 18 and 21. Well, what's it talking about? Well, I, maybe it's coincidental, folks, but verse 22 says this. When a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. I'll move on. But here's what I'm going to say. Women don't have affairs because of sex. Women have affairs because they meet a man who compliments them. They meet a man who listens. They meet a man who talks to them. You, you, you build security when you care for her above everything else, when you love and admire her. You, you, you build security through your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. Pastor, how, how can I do that? Well, look here. Uh, don't threaten to divorce your wife. You don't even need to be using that word. Yeah, no, no, just don't even use that word. Barbara and I got married and we decided, no, divorce is not gonna be a part of our vocabulary. Murder is, but divorce is not. <laughs> I'm saying, don't, look here, don't talk, don't, don't talk about how attractive other women are. Don't talk about how attractive other women are. Make, make long-range plans together. You'll build security into that wife. You say, Pastor, I want to build security. Well, uh, there's, there's a fourth thing you can do, and that is uh, your commitment to provide for her financially. Your commitment to provide for her financially. 1 Timothy 5 and 8 says, but if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own household, he's denied the faith, and he's worse than an infidel. By the way, folks, let me tell you something. There won't, sir, there won't anything work in your life until you do. And you can't express how much you love a woman if you're not willing to work and provide for her. You, you, I mean, I don't, I don't mean it wrong. You can't, and, and God help us in America, folks. I'm talking about men that are physically able to work. I'm not talking about people with medical situations. I'm not talking about people with disabilities. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the guy that's physically able. A uh, little girl and young boy got married and, he said to her one day, he said, boy, I sure wish you could make biscuits like mama. She said, yeah, and I wish you could bring home the dough like daddy, amen? <laughs> you said, what do you mean financial? I'm talking about, pray about financial decisions. When that wife knows you're not just arbitrarily making decisions, you're praying about it. You're a hard worker. You manage the resources wisely. You're not spending on the side that she doesn't know anything about. You're, you're managing the resources wisely. You said, Pastor, what's the greatest need my wife has? I'll tell you the greatest need she has. And if you ask her as you're going home today, she'll say, Pastor's right. Greatest need that any woman has is that need for security. Let me, let me tell you the second need of a woman. It's non-sexual affection. Non-sexual affection. And by the way, folks, I'll get to the man's needs next week, and it's totally different. You, 
years ago, this is true, I, years ago I read Red Book Magazine, The Things That Women Enjoy Most. There was an interesting article. Red Book Magazine, The Things That, that, that Women, Wives Enjoy Most. 29% said, re, said relaxing on the beach. 28% said a romantic dinner with my husband. A romantic dinner with my husband. 9% said having sexual relations. But here's what blew my mind. I read this article. True story, folks. Tr just blew my mind. 8% said a piece of chocolate cake. 8% and 9%. It just beat it out by point, amen? James Dobson said, 85% of women polled said, I'd rather have an emotional embrace and my husband emotionally embrace me rather than a physical relationship with him. So we've got to look for ways to non-sexual affection, whether it's a back rub or whatever, holding hands, embracing. You said, well, pastor, I won't. Listen, <laughs> hey, Vern, come up real close. You get this down, it'll lead to that. That didn't cost anything. I'm just giving you some good advice. <laughs> I learned a long time ago to grab Barbara's hand and, and, and squeeze it three times. Now, you don't know what that means. I squeeze it three times. It means I love you. And she squeezes mine back twice. That means me too. <laughs> See, a hug without a squeeze is like crackers without cheese. Amen? Hey, I love what Ed Young said. He said, while lust can cause many men to stray. A woman can literally be hugged into an affair if her marriage is void of affection. What, what's the needs? What's the needs of a woman? I'm talking about the third need of a woman is open communication. Open communication. See, see, see men rep report the facts. How'd your day go today? Fine. How'd that meeting go? It was good. How's people down there at work? Everybody's okay. And she wants to know the details. Not because she's nosy. It's because that's how she connects. So what I'm trying to say, a husband's got to make sure he takes time for open communication. Because it's so vitally important. Every night when I go to bed, this is strange, folks. Every night when I go to bed, I've got two fans over here. And I turn those two fans on for the noise. And, and then I've got a fan here that kind of blows on me. And then I've got a machine right here beside my bed. It's, a, it's the ocean. I go to the bed with the ocean every night. My pattern's pretty much the same. I get up about 5, 4.45, 5 o'clock each morning, and I go to the gym. And when I get back from that gym, I go in, and Barbara, it's pretty much the same. She said, Benny, cut those fans off. Benny, cut that ocean off. <laughs> and the whole time I'm there, getting ready in the morning, we're just talking. Because let me want to tell you what I've learned after almost 40 years of marriage. A woman needs open communication. She needs open communication. And, and wives, there's some things you can do to facilitate that. See, here's what, I, here's what I've done in my study. I have learned that men are emotionally modest and physically immodest. Men are emotionally modest and they're physically immodest as a whole. And you say, Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying this, a man will show you more of his body than he will his soul. A man will show you more of his body than he will his soul. But you know what I've learned about women? Women are physically modest and emotionally immodest. That's why they can literally be in the grocery store and be in a line at the grocery store and meet somebody for the first time and tell them their complete life story. <laughs> now, let me say something, folks. Let me, let, 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 let me say something. Let's just say hypothetically you don't. Let's just say you don't. So I know you don't. So let's, I know you don't. But let's just say you had a revealing photo of your wife. You don't. Hypothetically, you don't. I know you don't. But let's just say she, she was dressed in a, in, a, in a photo that would only be appropriate for you to see. 
And, and by the way, this is not the message. But, but, but I'm a preacher. And sometimes women, I see women, and I say to myself, you're showing what only your husband ought to be seeing. But let's just say you had a photo that was just, and you found out your husband had that photo. Of course, you knew it. And he took it down and showed it to his coworkers. And he said, wow, don't you think my wife's hot? You said, well, Pastor Benny, when I found out that, I'd, I'd be irate. I don't blame you. But can I tell you something? As humiliated and as hurt and disappointed as you'd be, when a man shares his heart with his wife, and then it comes up in a Bible study with all the ladies in the Bible study. And when all of her friends hears about what he shared from the depths of his heart, he feels the same way you would feel if that picture was shown of you. I'm preaching better than you're responding. And you wonder why he doesn't share anymore and why it's not open anymore. Uh, ladies, I'll tell you what, listen, listen, listen. There's things that are meant to be private. Let, let, me, let me tell you the fourth thing, that fourth need of a woman. It's leadership. It's leadership. Now, hear, hear me very clearly. I'm not talking about superiority. I'm not talking about anybody being superior or anybody being inferior. I'm not talking about domination. I'm not talking about dictatorship. I'm not talking about being the boss. And I'll tell you why. Because I don't believe any of that because I don't believe the Bible teaches that. I can't find one verse in the Bible where it teaches that. And by, and by the way, folks, I don't mean this wrong. I, I appreciate the President of the United States and I appreciate the governor and I appreciate, I appreciate everybody. But I'm not in fear to any of those people. They've just got a different function than I've got. You're not in fear to those people. They've just got a different function than you've got. A husband and wife have a different function. You say, Pastor, you, you, you say nobody's in fear. Where do you get that? Well, I just get it out of the Bible because look what Galatians 3.28 says. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. But I do believe that a husband has a responsibility to be a spiritual leader. And I believe he's to lead in the spiritual life of the family. I believe he's to lead in the finances. I believe he's to lead in the discipline of the children. And look here, I don't care how, I don't, it doesn't matter to me how strong personality a woman is. I mean, she can be a strong personality. She can have the gift of leadership as a woman. But I don't care who she is. There's still a desire innate in her. She's drawn to leadership. She's drawn to a man who will step up and lead. Look, folks, I'm old. I, I told you last Sunday, I've spoken over 10,000 times. How can you do that, Pastor Benny? Well, you gotta be old. But I've had women cry to me and just cry and say, Pastor Benny, I'd give anything if he'd be the spiritual leader. Tears would roll down their face. I wish he would lead. I begged him to lead. I try to provide a vacuum for him to lead. I'd give anything, Pastor Benny, if he'd just lead our home. I'd give anything if he'd do it. I need it, Pastor Benny, but he just won't lead. Pastor, how can I become the spiritual leader to my wife? I really want to become the spiritual leader to my wife. I want to, Pastor. I'm going to hit these real fast. Number one, serve your wife. Serve your wife. Jesus said, let the greatest among you be your servant. You start looking for ways you can serve your wife. You just start looking for ways to, to serve your wife. I, 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 I'm not, I, I, listen, there's a lot of room for improvement in my life. 
early this morning. Barbara, you want something to drink? No, I'll get up and get it. No, 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 honey. I'll go get it. No, I'll go get it, Barbara. Well, what do you do? You just look for ways to serve your wife. Get this. You come up real close. If serving is beneath you, leading is above you. See, Jesus, Jesus wasn't into titles. He was into towels. Jesus wasn't into titles. He was into towels. He took a towel and washed his disciples' feet. Pastor, I want to be the spiritual leader. You, you can be, but you've got, to, you've got to look for ways to serve your wife. Look, there's a second thing you can do. Celebrate her giftedness. Celebrate her giftedness. Not, not what you want, but the way God has gifted her. Celebrate her giftedness because, see, God has gifted that woman you're married to. She's got unique, wonderful gifts, and, 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 and you've got to discover those gifts. And then you start celebrating the giftedness in her life. Look, the greatest thing, listen, this is worth the price of admission today. The greatest thing you can do for any person is not give them your wealth. The greatest thing you can do for any person is reveal to them their own. You reveal to them their own. You celebrate their giftedness. The third thing you do is you initiate going to church. You initiate going to church. You say, honey, it's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. No, 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 baby. I, I, I may hit the golf ball after church, but while church, we need to be in church. No, 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 baby. No, no, baby. I, uh, look, and I, I can hunt Bambi on Saturday. It, it's the Lord's Day. And, and the family, we're, we're going to church. Dad, look here. Look, look, come up, Dad. Just, just hear me. Your little boy and girls are looking at you. You say, Pastor Benny, I'm depending on you. No, 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 no. They're not, they're not, look, Dad, they're looking at you. Church is no longer a possibility. It's not a, it, it's not a priority. It's a possibility. I, hey, hey, and I know, I, listen, I get beat up all the time, but I'm a tough, tough old bird. You're going to tell them how important Jesus is? But Sunday comes and, no, no, we're not going to church. You're going to be the next Chipper Jones. Hey, I'm going to give you a news flash. No, he's not. And why are you trying to relive your life? What was it you didn't get fulfilled in? What, what was it you didn't, what was it that you didn't, I mean, come on. Dad, you're five foot six. Mom, you're four foot 11 and you think he's gonna be the next great basketball player. I kind of doubt it. I'm sorry. Number four, ask her what you can pray for her about. And number five, pray with her. Billy Graham's ministry said one out of every two marriages are ending in divorce. But he said one out of every 1,014 Christian marriages are ending in divorce. And I immediately asked, well, my goodness, what constitutes a Christian marriage? And he said, we're a husband and wife daily pray together. Look here, men. You don't have to know the Bible cover to cover. And you don't have to pray a long prayer. But there's something to be said if you know what the needs are of your wife. And you just say, take her by the hand and say, God, help my wife with this. And God help me with that. And God help our children with this. And we love you, God. And I pray you give us a good day. You don't have to pray for 30 minutes in sackcloth and ashes. But there's something about when a husband and wife just pray together. I don't understand it, folks. 
I don't understand either, it says, if any two agree. I don't understand why one ox can pull two tons, but two oxen can pull 16 tons. I don't understand it. I don't understand why geese can fly 71% farther when they fly in a V formation. But there's something about coming together and there's something about praying together.